And uh, my name is Matt Atwell. I'm the associate pastor here. And today, what's happening is I'm finishing up a series on discipleship and growth. And two weeks ago, we started with in-growth, concern for self. And we did that because before we can help anyone else grow spiritually, we have to have a growing personal spiritual life. And then last week, we focused on cross-growth, concern for one another. And we looked at how God provided the church as a central means of growing spiritually. And we do that by discipling one another, which means that we do deliberate spiritual good to help each other follow Jesus. And I gave you a challenge last week. I challenge you to start doing deliberate spiritual good in the life of one person. And I hope that you rose to that challenge. And I hope that you will continue to rise to that challenge week by week, even day by day. And here's what we're doing. We're working from the inside out, right? Which is exactly what the gospel does. That's what Jesus does. When he changes us, he transforms us from the inside out. And that takes us to today, which is outgrowth, concern for the world. And so, this is where we focus on the people who are outside of these walls. And some of them are our friends and family. Some of them are our neighbors. Some of them are fellow American citizens. But others are not. Others are outside of our neighborhood and, and our community and our city and our country and even our continent. They, they speak different languages. They eat different foods. And so before we, we jump in this morning, let's take a moment to stop and, and to pray for our world. God, we come before you today recognizing that there is nothing special about our skin. There is nothing special about our blood. And what unites our brothers and sisters in Christ around the world is not the blood that's running through us, but it's the blood of Jesus. And there are many, many, many in the world today who do not know him. Who have, some have never heard his name. Some have no resources available for them to do so. And others have heard his name, but it's, it's in the wrong context. It's, it's a false teaching. It's a lie. And God, we pray as we look outside these walls today and you're in the scriptures just pour into our lives and they teach us and they transform the way that we, we live, God, that our heart would be for the world, that we would be concerned for the world. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. And so you've noticed that a central theme flowing throughout this series has been concern, right? And so... In, in order for us to help someone else, we first have to have concern for ourselves, but it certainly doesn't stop there. We're not called to just have concern for ourselves. We're called to serve others. We're called to bear one another's burdens. We're supposed to, remember 1 Thessalonians 5.15 last week, always pursue what is good for one another and for all. And so last week was more concerned on the one another aspect, but this week we moved to the all. We need to have concern for the people in this world who are walking the wide road to destruction.
Do we care enough to go tell people? Jesus cared enough to command us to. Jesus cared enough to die for the world. And so he cared about the harvest. And before we jump into Matthew 10, the passage that I read earlier this morning, I wanted to show you what Jesus said in Matthew 9 before he sent his disciples out. So in Matthew 9, verses 37 and 38, he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Now, he said the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. And, the, and that statement would certainly make sense at the time, wouldn't it? Because at, every, things were just getting started then, right? I mean, Christianity was just like a little local startup with very few investors. Uh, there was still a whole world full of people who didn't have a clue who Jesus was. But is that still true today? I mean... It's been over 2,000 years, and you know now we can read the Bible in, in many different languages on our phones. Uh, we can turn on the TV and listen to preachers and, and hear them on the radio, whatever good that is sometimes. Uh, I mean, we can chat with people online from all over the world. You can even reach, you can even proclaim the gospel in virtual reality communities now. I mean, there's multitudes of denominations and churches spread across the globe. So the question is, is the harvest still plentiful and are the workers still few? Well, let's work our way from the inside out. Uh, you've got your notes here. In, uh, in 2010, in Eugene, 75% identified as unreligious. Okay, so we're starting in Eugene. 75% in 2010, it's been almost a decade, identified as unreligious. And of course, we know just because you identify as religious doesn't mean you're following Christ. And so even out of that remaining percentage, only 9.86% identified as evangelical Protestant. And so less than 10% are evangelical Protestant. And of course, we know that even within that percentage, how many are preaching false gospels? How many healthy churches are there really? Uh, Barna identified Eugene as the 64th most post-Christian city in America. I mean, it's not top 10, but there's a lot of cities in America, right? So we work our way from the inside out. Let's move out to our country. America, 43% are unchurched. And, and we're talking about unchurched. We're not talking about people who grew up in it and then left. That's de church. We're talking about people who have never been a part of it. That's huge. Not to mention the fact that, yeah, there's a big percentage that have been churched or are currently churched, but again, just because you're in a church doesn't mean you're following Christ. We'll move out to the world. On the back of your notes, there's a diagram here. It looks like that. I'm going to give you a little uh, missions education here. Uh, this is a diagram that the International Mission Board, which is the missions organization of the Southern Baptist Convention, uses to categorize people groups. And uh, we're going to walk, I'm just going to briefly go through here and, and teach you guys a little bit about how they categorize different groups of people. If they're status level zero, they have no evangelical Christians or churches. No access to major evangelical print, audio, visual, or human resources. Nothing. Okay? If they're level one, it's less than 2% evangelical. Some resources available, but no active church planting in the past two years. Uh, level two, less than 2% evangelical. Initial, like the beginning of church planting within the past two years. Status three, less than 2% evangelical, but widespread church planting within the past two years. Four is greater than or equal to 2% evangelical. Five greater than or equal to 5%. Six greater than or equal to 10%. And then below that, there's a diagram that looks like this. And it shows the different status levels. And then under people, that means people groups. And different organizations, you know, everybody's got a different idea of what a people group is. But uh, a big thing is the population there. So under status level zero, it's not huge in world population standards, but still, over 9.5 million people are in that group of, remember, it was nothing. No Christians, no resources, no churches, no anything available. Nothing happening. 
That's still big. But then remember, level one was less than 2% evangelical with no active church planting in the past two years. So very, very tiny percentage of Christians and no church planting happening jumps up a bit. Almost 950 million people in that category. And then level two was less than 2% evangelical with just the beginnings of church planting. It jumps up again. Almost 2 billion people. And then level three was still less than 2% evangelical, but widespread church planting happening. And that's over 1.5 billion. So still out of those first 0, 1, 2, and 3, you're still looking at less than 2% evangelical. And, and what we got, like two, three and a half, four, almost four and a half billion people are in those categories. So we have concern, folks, because the harvest is still plentiful and the workers are still few. Jesus did tell us that the road to life was narrow and only few would find it. And so that work of praying for and sending and going out into the harvest, it never stops. Not until he comes back and ends it. Our work in the world never stops. We need to have concern for our world. And as we get back to Matthew 10, that was a long passage that I read earlier, and we're not going to be able to dissect every bit of it. I'm going to, I'm going to highlight certain parts of it. And the first part that I want to highlight is is the very beginning of it, which was verse 16. Jesus said, Behold, I am sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves, so be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. Now, I believe this is often a misunderstood and sometimes confusing verse for people. Um, I mean, Jesus is like, be, be like a snake? I mean, what, is he telling me to, to bite people? Is he, is he telling me to, to hang out in the bushes and wait so that I can scare pregnant women like the snake in our, at our house does? Uh, be like a dove? I mean, what? Am I supposed to fly away and poop on people's cars? You know? I mean, what's Jesus trying to say here? Well, as, as most of the time is the case, context is key. And if we look, remember the context, Jesus is sending his disciples out. And what he's doing here is he's preparing them for the difficulties for the persecution that they're going to face. And so he's teaching them how to approach persecution. And so, let's say that because of a biblically sound sermon that I preached, that our government decided that because of that biblically sound sermon that I should be whipped and thrown into prison. Now some of you would, would be like, well, they'll have to go through me first. You know, some are going to have that natural inclination to fight, Right? You don't want to see injustice done to our brothers and sisters in Christ. And, and that's understandable, but there's something I want to remind us. There's plenty of places that I could point to in Scripture. But I'm going to point this to Romans 12, verses 18 through 21, where Paul said, If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not overcome, be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. See, as followers of Christ, we, we know to expect persecution. Jesus told us not to be surprised by it. But we also know that we serve a God. We don't, we don't have to take justice and vengeance into our own hands because we serve a God who sees all and will ultimately make all things right. We can trust his hands. I don't trust mine. I don't trust my just, justice and my vengeance, but I trust God's. Right? And so when Jesus says be wise as serpents, he's not telling us to fight. It's the opposite. Remember, he said, I'm sending you out like sheep in the midst of wolves. As in, we are prey, but be like a wise as a serpent. As in, but don't be dumb prey, right? You're a sheep, but don't be a stupid sheep. Be smart. Be a, be a smart sheep. Don't, don't run toward persecution with a martyr complex. Like, hey, here am I, kill me. Put me in prison. But then at the same time, when it comes, don't fight back. Be innocent as doves. See, our posture is not one of aggression. It's not one of, of fighting back. It, 
Don't forget you're a sheep, not a wolf. Right? Be like a snake, smart. And like a dove, innocent. Safe. And he says, I mean, but don't return evil with evil. Rather, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. Overcome evil with good. And Jesus goes on to say in, in verse 19 of Matthew 10, remember, he's still talking about persecution. He says, when they deliver you over, do not be anxious how you are to speak or what you are to say. For what you are to say will be given you to you in that hour. Now, Jesus is giving his disciples a reason to be comforted in times of persecution. And, and I know that we're not being dragged into court or thrown into prison right now, but I also believe that we can share in the comfort of his words. Now, here's what he's not saying. He's not, he's not telling us to be unprepared people, right? He's not telling me as a preacher to just wing it. Praise God for that. You should be thankful for that. Okay? Uh, he, he's not saying that. He's not telling us to just stop learning how to articulate the gospel and defend our faith. But what he is reminding these disciples is that, hey, you're not alone. You've got the Spirit of God. Now, is Jesus talking about our personal, our conversations of the gospel with our friends? I mean, not in this context, but the, the comfort of the Holy Spirit is true for every believer. Do you ever get afraid? Do you have fear of talking to people about the gospel, of proclaiming the gospel in our world? Do you have fear that you might not know what to say? That you might not have all the answers? There's no need to worry. Be obedient to what Jesus has commanded and trust Him. Let the Spirit give you comfort and peace. Again, He's not giving us a license to stop learning and just being like, depending on the Holy Spirit to magically impart with knowledge of the Scriptures to us whenever we're out talking to people. But what he is reminding his disciples of is, hey, you can't be prepared for everything that's going to come. They were going to face things that they could not prepare for. And, and how could any person ever be prepared for every possible situation you can find yourself in, every conversation you might have? You can't. You couldn't. But what we can do is prepare to the best of our ability. And then just walk, walk in faith. Trust the Lord. Realize that the, we have the Spirit of God, and so we don't need to be afraid in any situation. Because there is no need to fear people. Right? If you remember verses 26 and 27, he went on to say, So have no fear of them, for nothing is covered that will not be revealed or hidden that will not be known. What I tell you in the dark, say in the light, and what you hear whispered, proclaim on the housetops. Now, this verse 26, you can see similar uh, statements in other parts of Scripture, and sometimes like the exact wording, and generally it's talking about the reality that everyone's deeds and hearts are going to be uncovered one day. Right? Nobody gets away with anything. Every, everything that anyone tries to hide in this life is going to be revealed. It's going to be brought to light. God's going to do that. But then because of verse 27, I think there's also an element of the good news of the gospel that had been hidden and would soon be spread across the globe. You see, we have concern because the Savior has been revealed. The Savior has been revealed. Have you ever hidden something? Or hid something? I don't know what the right way to say that is. Anybody ever you hide something? Does anybody hide Christmas or birthday presents? Okay, right? <laughs> now, whenever you hide a gift, do you hide it with the purpose of keeping it hidden? No. Do you, I mean, do you hide it so that it'll just stay hidden and never be open? Of course not. Nobody hides something so that it stays hidden forever. Well, again, except for those who are trying to hide their sins, but that's not going to work out. But no, you hide something, you hide a gift, so that it will be revealed at the right time. Right? And, and Jesus, he did this with himself a lot too, didn't he? I mean, he didn't even start his public ministry until many years into his life. And even when he did, he kept a low profile much of the time. But he had a plan, guys. He had a plan. Jesus was like this 
gift that was wrapped in swaddling clothes on Christmas. Right? And then he was hidden until he was displayed on the cross at the crucifixion. And then that gift was unwrapped on, on Easter whenever those wrappings around his body fell off because he conquered the grave. And of course, the disciples wouldn't understand all of that until later, but I think they can look back and, and realize Jesus uh, telling them, like, go, tell the world. Shout it from the rooftops. I'm conquering for you, and you will be more than conquerors. You don't need to be afraid. Everything's going to be revealed. And, and he told them about fear. In the very next verse, he said, Do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. <coughs> I believe what Jesus is saying here is, Guys, don't, don't fear people, but fear what happens to people if they don't have me, right? Don't fear what people can do to you, but fear what God does to those who reject the Savior. You see, so much of our concern for this world is built upon the reality that hell is real. Hell is real. But we live in a time where universalist beliefs are growing exponentially and evangelism is being increasingly frowned upon. But the, the truth is that not everyone will spend eternity with the Lord. Unless someone repents of their sins and chooses to put their trust in what Christ did for them on the cross and follow Him, they will spend eternity separated from God. And that is no small thing. And when we forget that truth, don't we forget, we lose our concern for the world, don't we? And I, I think a lot of people are forgetting that truth. And I think it's having an impact on evangelism and missions in our world. Lifeway had another study that they did. And in this study of the people they uh, surveyed, of those who went to church at least once a month, which is, you know, not a high standard, but they went to church at least once a month out of those, 55% had not proclaimed the gospel in the past six months. What was even more surprising is that those 65 and older were even more likely to say they hadn't proclaimed the gospel in the past six months. So those with the most experience following Jesus were the least likely to proclaim the gospel. That is not how we finish a race. That is not how we... Be an example to the younger generations. But more and more it seems that believers in general are becoming increasingly distracted from Jesus' commands. I mean, do we really believe that He is the way, the truth, and the life, and that no one comes to the Father except through Him? If we believe that, then we must have concern for the world. We must. We must care about the harvest. We must care about the harvest. But here's what that doesn't mean. It doesn't mean that we have control over the harvest. 1 Corinthians 3, 5 through 7. Paul said, what then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants through whom you believed as the Lord assigned to each. I planted Apollos water, but God gave the growth. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. You see, our job is not to make people follow Christ. We can't do that. We plant the seeds. We water the soil. We spread the fertilizer. We, we announce, proclaim the good news of the gospel by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. But we're not in control of the harvest. But I fear, though, that this truth is also abused in a way that causes some to not have concern for the harvest. Right? Like, I mean, just 
It's true that I'm not in control of whether or not my friend repents and chooses to follow Christ, but does that mean that I lose concern for his soul? Just because I'm har the, not the harvester, does that mean I don't care about the harvest? I mean, do, does a farmer have control over whether his crops grow? No. Does a farmer care if his crops grow? Yeah, of course he does. But, but I've seen Christians who, who seem to not care whether or not the crops grow. You know, some, they believe in hell, but they live like everybody's going to heaven. Others have the, a small church mentality. Now, I've grown up in small churches. I, I love them. I believe that there's so many benefits to small churches. But, but how could I ever say that I like, want our church to stay small? That would be like saying, I don't want us to reach people with the gospel, right? I mean, that doesn't make sense. You know, uh, and so when somebody says, well, you know, I, I just want us to stay a small church. I'm like, you don't, I mean, you don't want us, you don't want people to get saved and to join us in, in worshiping and following Jesus? Well, that's, that's like a, a farmer who plants seeds, but they're like, oh, you know, I don't really care if they grow or not. In fact, I'd prefer if they didn't. <laughs> Does it make any sense? And it's true, it doesn't make sense, which is why I think what happens is those who don't seem concerned about the harvest, they just don't plant the seeds. Right? They don't water the soil. They don't spread the fertilizer. And so when somebody says, you know, I just want us to stay a small church, I want to be like, you sure do, because you're not helping us reach anybody. But then there's those who do care, who are concerned, and who are trying to, and we also have to remember that we could plant and water and fertilize our entire life and never see the harvest that we hoped to. But we must never lose concern for the harvest. We need to care about the crops. We so pray. Go, tell people. Don't be a contradiction like the men in the clip I'm about to show you. Let's make sure we got the And so for those reasons, I believe the crankbait is the most versatile and fruitful lure you could possibly have. Well, that concludes this week's discussions. I uh, want to thank everybody for coming out today. And I also want to thank our newest member, Andrew, for showing up and joining us today. Thank you. Okay, so does anybody have any announcements or any upcoming events or dates that we need to know about? Oh, oh yeah, we got the bake sale coming up on the 23rd, and we use everybody's help for that. Also, our uh, group potluck is coming up on the 30th, and it's going to be in the main hall. And I will be bringing my mama's famous chili. That's right, that's right. 30th main hall potluck supper. Also, there's a great fly fishing seminar over in Monroe this weekend. Um, I'm going to be carpooling, so if anybody wants to go, they just let me know. Tickets are $5, and the speaker is supposed to be amazing. That's fantastic. If anybody wants to go with Rick, be sure and get with him after the, the meeting, all right? Anything else you can think of? Yeah, I uh, have a question. What is our next fishing trip? And I have a new reel, and I'm ready to try it out. Yeah. <laughs> what are you talking about? You know, going fishing. Okay. What about this Saturday? Oh, it's, it's supposed to be like really cold that day. Next Saturday? That's the day of the bake sale and we can't miss that. Two weeks maybe? Like on a Thursday I might can take off. I have classes like all day. How about this summer? I don't fish like swim south for the summer. I gotta get my dog spayed. Also, I'm allergic to water. Helping my neighbor change all of his light bulbs. A high pollen count day. My mom had a really bad reaction one time, and I think it runs in the family. It's my dog's birthday. <laughs> He's turning four. I just can't handle the sun. Do you even have your license? Do you have your permit? Could you tell me what's the difference? I got this blue card in the mail, and I'm not sure. I think it was a boating license, but I don't have a boat, so I don't know why they sent it to me. Has anyone here gone fishing ever? So nobody has actually ever gone fishing in a fishing group here. <laughs> Thanks, guys. It's nice meeting y'all. Good luck.
Oh. Oh, hey. We still need to elect Apollo chairman. Right. Oh, he's right. Yeah, yeah. 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 Hear everything, but there was a a, group, a fishing group meeting together, and there was a new guy there in their meeting, and and uh, he's listening to them talk about fishing. They're talking about all these trainings and all these other things not even related to fishing that they do. And eventually, he starts trying to schedule like, "Hey, when can we go fishing?" And, and they're like, "Uh, what?" And they just start making excuses, and eventually he realizes, "Okay, so I've come to." So there's this fishing group, and it's full of people who don't fish. And Matthew 4, 18 through 20, while walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. Remember... Jesus told these men to teach people to obey everything that I have commanded you. He taught them to be fishers of men, and he taught them to teach people to be fishers of men, who would teach people to be fishers of men. We don't come here to just learn about fishing and talk about fishing. Go. Fish. God, thank you for bringing us together this morning. We pray that the words of Christ Uh, that they would just penetrate our hearts. We pray that no one at Riviera would be a contradiction. God, we, we love the world that you have created. We love the people that you have created. And, and we long for them to know you, to spend eternity with you, to experience the love of Jesus. But how can they know if no one tells them? And how will anyone tell them if they've not been sent? And Jesus, you send us. God, we send one another. We pray for the harvest. We beg of you, God, to send, that we would send people out into the harvest. It's plentiful, and the workers are few. We pray that we would be burdened with the lostness of the world, but not in a way that causes us to, to feel hopeless, but in the right way that causes us to, to act, that causes us to go and tell, to fish. Of course, we trust in you as the harvester, the one who is ultimately in control of the harvest. And we recognize that, that we can't make anyone follow Christ. Oh, but we, we won't just stand beside as they walk through life and not even know about him, not even hear his name. God, our heart breaks for the almost nine and a half million who have nothing, no resources, no Christians, and the almost four and a half billion who are less than two percent evangelical Christians. God, our heart breaks for the city of Eugene. so many of whom are completely unreligious. And we know that religion is not the answer. Jesus is the answer. There's so many religions out there touting something that's not the full and true gospel, and we pray against those gospels, God. We pray for the light to shine as a city on a hill. God, we ask that Riviera would be a light post, we, that we would be a place that sends out workers into the harvest.
And we pray, even for those who are around us, God, we can sometimes reach the nations right in our neighborhoods. In our backyards, we have people all around us who could be from anywhere in the world. Oh, I pray that our heart would be to disciple others. And as we finish this series, that we would have concern for our own personal spiritual growth, that we would have concern for the spiritual growth of our brothers and sisters in Christ in our local church, and that we would have concern for the spiritual well-being of our world. And we know that the gospel does not go out void. There is not power in us, but there is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the gospel, and we trust that power, and we walk with the Holy Spirit, trusting Him to give us the right words at the right time. And God, help us to prepare to the best of our abilities to share, to proclaim the gospel, but to walk in faith, trusting that we can't be prepared for every situation and every conversation we might find ourselves in. But we are not alone. We have the Spirit of God. And we have each other. So help us to lean on those. And we ask all these things in the name of our perfect, wonderful, sacrificial Savior. Amen. I want to share a short story uh, as a as a benediction today. It's a story that was shared by a man named Darren Carlson. Here's what he said. A friend of mine tells of a Persian migrant who arrived at a refugee center at 6 a.m., visibly upset. He told his story to a Persian pastor. During the night, he saw someone dressed in white raise his hand and say, Stand up and follow me. The Persian man said, Who are you? The man in white replied, I am the Alpha and the Omega. I am the way to heaven. No one can go to the Father except through me. He began to ask the Persian pastor, Who is he? What, what, what am I going to do? What, why did he ask me to follow him? How shall I go? Tell me. In response, the pastor held out his Bible and asked, Have you seen this before? No, he replied. Do you know what it is? No. The pastor then opened to the book of Revelation. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. The man started crying and said, How can I accept him? How can I follow him? So the pastor led him in prayer and peace came over him. The pastor then gave the man a Bible and told him to hide it, since the Muslims in the camps could cause him trouble. Oh, silly pastor. But the man replied, The Jesus that I met today, he's more powerful than the Muslims in the camp. He left and an hour later returned with ten more Persians and told the pastor, These people want the Bible. No one had to teach him an evangelistic strategy. Christians. Jesus is more powerful than your fears. Jesus is more powerful than our shortcomings. Jesus is more powerful than our inexperience. Fear not those who can kill the body, but not the soul. Fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Amen.